Just that. Hey, Kristen. Hey, Dan. Well, welcome to my lab. We'll be studying cryptosporidium and protein this semester. So, I want you guys to help me figure out the genome. But, first, let's watch an instructional video, okay? Sounds good. good. Cryptosporidiosis, also known as crypto, is the disease caused by the coccidian parasite Cryptosporidium parvum. The genome sequencing of Cryptosporidium parvum has not yet been completed, but the part of the genome that has been sequenced is made up of DNA. Its length is 9.1 megabases and it is composed of eight chromosomes ranging from 1.04 to 1.5 megabases, with a guanine cytosine content around 30%. The genome also lacks all the de novo biosynthetic capacities in that it cannot make its own amino acids, nucleotides, or sugars, and thus needs the host for nutrition and replication. The mechanisms by which the parasite uses the host for replication have not been observed or concluded. It has been also determined that less than 5% of the sequenced genes in Cryptosporidium parvum contain introns, or non-transcribed sequences of DNA that are removed during RNA splicing. This lack of introns, along with the loss of all de novo biosynthetic pathways, has caused the genome of Cryptosporidium parvum to be contact compact when compared to other related organisms. To finish the sequencing of the genome, researchers need to find a better genetic marker because the useful highly polymorphic genetic mar markers identified in other organisms are almost always found in introns. Another difficulty in finding out more about the replication mechanisms and metabolic processes of Cryptosporidium parvum can be attributed to the fact that the entire life cycle cannot be successfully completed in culture, so a controlled study at the microscopic level cannot be performed. There are many types of Cryptosporidium parasites, two of which are causative agents in humans, Cryptosporidium parvum and Cryptosporidium hominis. Cryptosporidium hominis is only known to transfer from human to human, so we will be focusing on Cryptosporidium parvum because the animal to human transmission is an important part of the Cryptosporidiosis disease. Cryptosporidium parvum is an obligate intracellular parasite, which means it cannot reproduce outside the host cells and its reproduction relies entirely on host cell nutrition. This means that the life cycle and transmission of crypto plays an important role in its pathogenesis which we will see later on. The most common way Cryptosporidium parvum is transmitted is through direct contact with animal or human feces. The parasite gets into the body and replicates, and once it enters back into the environment, it is able to survive outside a host cell for a long time, waiting for a new host to pick it up. There are three main ways Cryptosporidium parvum can be transmitted. Through infected water sources, through contaminated food, and through direct contact with infected feces. The most common mode of contraction of the three just listed is through the ingestion of contaminated water. There are three main ways a human can come into contact with the virus through contaminated water. 1. Ingestion of lake, river, or pond water. 2. Ingestion of water in pools, water parks, or wave pools. And 3. Ingestion of contaminated groundwater. River and lake water is the most common water source associated with crypto because it comes into direct contact with animal feces most often. This poses a problem, especially if water is filtered directly from an infected lake or river into homes. Humans also commonly contract crypto from swimming pools, wave pools, and public drinking sources, such as water fountains or groundwater. The bacteria is able to overcome many forms of water filtration, chlorine, and other agents created to kill the parasite that are often seen in swimming pools. Because of its resistance, it is able to survive in semi-filtered drinking water and chlorination in pools, making those perfect reservoirs for human contraction. The other two modes of transmission are much less common than the consumption of infected water. The first is through uncooked food, which usually occurs when an asymptomatic person infects a food source. The second most common often occurs among small children and is the direct transmission through contact with infected feces and is also seen among daycare providers and caregivers to small children. The cryptosporidium parvum cells travel into the intestine where it attaches to the intestinal cells. Upon attachment, the life cycle inside the host begins and the disease begins to take form. The parasite cryptosporidium parvum has a monoxinous life cycle, 
meaning the entire developmental cycle occurs within one host organism. The cycle consists of an asexual phase followed by a sexual phase. Once ingested, oocysts migrate through the gastrointestinal tract of the host to the small intestine, where existation of the oocysts occurs and four sporozoites are released from the oocysts and attach themselves to the intestinal walls. Sporozoites are the cell stage in the life cycle of Cryptosporidium parvum that infects new host cells and are elongated modal forms which lack flagella but move by gliding. This gliding motility is driven by the coupling of the translocation of surface adhesins on the parasite which is driven by an actin myosin motor beneath the parasite plasma membrane. Sporozoite-specific lectin adherence factor enhances the adherence of the sporozoites to the cilia on the epithelial cells within the small intestine. Glycoprotein GP900 mediates the attachment and invasion to host cells and localizes at the apical end of the sporozoites. Once inside the host cell membrane, sporozoites become trophozoites and remain in the host cell membrane. Thus, the parasite Cryptosporidium parvum is intracellular but extracytoplasmic in its invasion of host cells. Trophozoites are the activated intracellular feeding stage of the life cycle of Cryptosporidium parvum. After gorging itself on the host, trophozoites undergo asexual reproduction by multiple fission or schizogony and develop into type 1 merons. The fusion of trophozoites into aggregates of two or more develop into type 1 merons. Type 1 merons appear as grape-like aggregates and contain eight daughter cells or type 1 merozoites, which are released from type 1 merons and are small, non-modal, and circular shaped. Once released, some of the type 1 merozoites can cause auto-infection in neighboring host cells and others become type 2 merons which have a rosette-like pattern and contain four type 2 morozoites, which when released upon the bursting of the host epithelial cell, attach themselves to adjacent epithelial cells in the small intestine. At this point in the life cycle of Cryptosporidium parvum, type 2 morozoites go through a process called gametogony, which is the development of morozoites into either macrogametes, which is the female sexual form, or microgametes, which is the male sexual form. Microgametes from microgametes fertilize macrogametes upon penetration to produce zygotes, which can develop into oocysts of two types. 20% of these oocysts become thin-walled sporulated oocysts which reinfect the host by rupturing from the host cell and thereby releasing sporozoites which restart the life cycle and expand the infection. 80% of these oocysts become thick-walled sporulated oocysts which are mature and infective upon being secreted from the host and can survive in the environment without a host for months. When Cryptosporidium parvum enters a human host and sporozoites attach to intestinal walls, this causes acute inflammation of the stomach and intestines. Characteristics of the disease include vomiting, fever, watery diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Dehydration, weight loss, and malnutrition may occur as a result of the vomiting and diarrhea. These symptoms typically last for up to two weeks, but the time frame and severity of the infection is dependent upon the strength of the infected individual's immune system and their age. In order to fully understand the effects and severity of the disease, patients are distinguished by competent or compromised immune systems. Immunocompetent patients typically do not need medical treatment as the acute gastroenteritis is self-limiting and the infection resolves itself. Recurrent gastrointestinal symptoms may occur in 30 to 40 percent of immunocompetent individuals. Patients may elect to receive IV fluids as they are still at risk for severe dehydration and malnourishment during an extended infection. Immunocompromised patients who become infected by Cryptosporidium parvum have an increased risk for symptoms of the disease to become chronic and possibly deadly if medical assistance is not acquired. The most common form of immunodeficiency in crypto patients 
has been identified as HIV-infected patients. These individuals have low CD4 T cell counts. For these individuals, infection is associated with persistent diarrhea lasting more than 30 days. Individuals infected by crypto could die from malnutrition and dehydration. However, this occurs mostly in immunocompromised patients. Immunocompetent patients recover from the disease by restoring nutrients and liquids faster than they are lost. Studies have been done to show that HIV-positive individuals are more at risk to die than patients who do not have an immunocompromising disease. It has been hypothesized that after the attachment of sporozytes, the epithelial mucosa cells release soluble factors such as histamine and serotonin, which increase intestinal secretion of water and inhibit water absorption. This is the cause of vomiting and diarrhea. The human body's immune response to Cryptosporidium parvum is focused on eradication of sporozytes from the intestinal tract. Sporozytes are the primary stepping stone for reproduction of the parasite, so by inhibiting their entry into epithelial cells, infection can be stopped. Here are some details on the body's innate immunity. When sporozytes infect epithelial cells, the sporozytes release compounds that interact with toll-like receptors on the epithelial cells and cause them to activate NFKB. NFKB is a key inflammatory transcription factor that allows the expression of pro-inflammatory chemokines, which then causes inflammation of the intestines. <clears throat> NFKB also promotes production of antimicrobial peptides, which partially inhibit the viability of spirozytes. Infection of epithelial cells also trigger prostaglandin production. Prostaglandins can modulate T cell activation, decrease inflammation, and also promote increased mucin production. This is a contributing mechanism to diarrhea. Natural killer cells are also recruited to the area of infection and produce interferon gamma in response to spirozite presence in the intestines. Interferon gamma directly inhibits crypto's reproduction in human enterocyte cell lines by preventing sporozyte invasion and by depleting intracellular iron availability. Here are some details on the immunopathogenesis of crypto. During infection, sporozytes erode the villi of the intestinal wall, leaving it smooth and reducing the ability of the intestines to absorb nutrients and water. As this occurs, lymphocytes, macrophages, and neutrophils infiltrate the infection site. Infection leads to increased interferon gamma production, and the inflammation increases production of cytokines, which prevent epithelial absorption and is a causative agent of diarrhea. Studies have shown that numbers of CD4 and CD8 T cells subside in parallel with recovery from infection, suggesting that the infection drives the inflammatory response. Now let's talk about the body's adaptive immunity. T cells are essential for parasite clearance as chronic Cryptosporidium parvum infections are observed in T cell deficient mice and can be cleared by injection of T cell containing lymphoid cells from normal mice. HIV life threatening infection is common in HIV patients with low CD4 T cell counts. Restoration of CD4 T cells following antiretroviral therapy confers resistance to Cryptosporidium parvum infections. CD8 T cells are less important in immunity as absence within the host leaves their ability to control infection either unaffected or only mildly diminished. Th1 and Th2 responses are both active during an infection, but the exact pathway is not yet known. However, it has been determined from studies in mice that a interferon gamma deficient subject will either die or remain persistently infected with Cryptosporidium parvum, suggesting its key role in clearance of the infection. Interferon gamma will help signal T cells and macrophages into the mucosa to help fight the infection. Here are some details on the body's humoral immunity. The role of antibodies in immunity to Cryptosporidium parvum is unclear in humans.
The main method of diagnosis for cryptosporidium parvum is the identification of oocysts after fecal flotation in sucrose or zinc sulfate. The oocysts in the fecal smear will appear red after acid fast staining. If the fecal flotation method is not sufficient, genetic methods of identification of the species genome can be done using the polymerase chain reaction. PCR allows researchers to make thousands of copies of the microbe genome in order to identify it. Cryptosporidium parvum has only been a human pathogen since 1976, and in that time, no antimicrobial treatment has been found. The only real treatment for immunocompetent patients is the use of antidiarrheal medications such as ammonium and to stay hydrated until the symptoms subside. For this reason, the disease is still included in the World Health Organization's list of neglected diseases. The best form of treatment for this disease is prevention. Personal prevention consists of water filtration systems in the home, as well as the importance of functional water systems for public water sources. After an outbreak in Milwaukee, water districts have created more rigorous turbidity tests, which can effectively measure the levels of contamination of water supplies. In the spring of 1993, the largest documented waterborne disease outbreak in U.S. history occurred in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Once several stool samples identified Cryptosporidium parvum as a cause, a boil water advisory was advertised, and one of the two water treatment plants of the area was shut down. The source ended up being insufficient treatment of the water, which comes from Lake Michigan. However, over 400,000 residents were already infected with the parasite. This was the largest outbreak since its first appearance in humans in Tennessee in a three-year-old girl. Rural areas have a higher incidence of cryptosporidium because cattle commonly shed oocysts in their feces, even when they do not show symptoms. For this reason, there's not necessarily a higher incidence of the disease in certain places rather than others. For example, the U.S. and U.K. have some of the highest incidences in the world, along with Africa and Australia. In developing countries, however, such as Africa, the disease causes more of a problem because immunocompromised people have a hard time fighting it, especially where medication and sanitary measures are not readily accessible. Cryptosporidium accounts for up to 20% of all cases of childhood diarrhea in developing countries and is a potentially fatal complication for people with AIDS. To date, there have been six major outbreaks in the United States affecting over 400,000 people. Although there have been no treatments found, genetic methods have been developed to detect the cryptosporidium oocytes. There is, however, much research that needs to be done because cryptosporidium parvum and cryptosporidiosis, the disease it caused, has the potential to infect a large number of people.